you know, whenever I work with Kubernetes, I, I really can't remember how to write my manifest, so I definitely need some of that copilot thing. Uh, <laughs> but, so, hello. My name is Richard. Uh, most people just call me Carding. This is really my second time attending a user group Singapore meetup. I mostly attend the Philippines meetup, so I've never talked in front of a very large audience like this before. So, one of the things I really ask for you to do after the after the uh, after the event is let us know uh, through the organizers as well um, if we're you know we're hitting the right level in the talks as well, so it can help us calibrate. Because you know, uh, I really don't know like the kind of levels where we need to be talking about in Singapore. So, what I do is I'm a prototyping engineer for AWS in ASEAN. Uh, we work with a lot. Of, we work with a lot of tech. So pretty much, kind of the breadth of things instead of really the depth. Um, we touch on a lot of technologies, and one of the things we really see very, very often is Kubernetes for some reason. Uh, containers, serverless, and all that jazz, right? Um, today, I'd pretty much just like to talk about a few things, uh, particularly in GitOps. So, with the short time I have, I'd like to give a brief background on Kubernetes, just to make sure that everybody's on, you know, kind of the same footing on what Kubernetes is, uh, is and what it does, et cetera, what, what you, uh, how you do stuff, what you can do with it, and so on and so forth. And then we'll jump right into what is GitOps? Like, what is the argument for it? What, why do we want or why are we interested in doing stuff like GitOps? And then maybe we'll touch into some, of, some bit of live coding just to see what, you know, how things actually work and so on and so forth. Sounds good? Yeah. Cool. Um, so who among you work with Kubernetes on a regular basis? Oh, wow, pretty cool, pretty cool amount. Good. Uh, how many of you regret it? <laughs> oh, there we go, cool. Thanks for being honest. Now, I, I like to wail on Kubernetes, but um, kidding aside, it's a very, very good tool. It's a great tool. Uh, if, you, if, if you use it, you know, for the right reasons, but again, the question is, what are the right, right reasons, right? And I'm not gonna go into that kind of worms. So, <laughs> um, just to give everybody an overview of what Kubernetes is. Um, Kate's is a container orchestration tool. So what you do with Kubernetes is that you tell it that I, wanna, I want you to run these and this containers, maybe three of them, five of them, and so on and so forth, and Kubernetes does its best to maintain that for you. So if you asked it, hey, I want, to, I want five copies of a container, it will do its absolute best to make sure that there's exactly five of them running. So if one of them crashes, or for some reason, there's now 10 of those containers, um, what Kubernetes will do is it'll make sure that it, you, you have just the five, right? So if one of them crashes, it's pretty much an automatic health check and all that, right? Um, Kubernetes is also an abstraction. It's a pretty big abstraction, and this is something that a lot of people don't understand or don't comprehend fully. The one of, I think one of the biggest draws for Kubernetes is that it's, it abstracts everything, mostly everything, about your infrastructure and your platform, right? So if you're running on top of Kubernetes and you're deploying on Kubernetes, um, you really don't have to think about, are you running on AWS? Are you running on EC2, on Fargate, on a fleet of Raspberry Pis? Uh, are, are you on an on-premises kind of location? You really don't have to think about that for the most part, right? So the idea behind it is that it's supposedly agnostic that you can bring Kubernetes anywhere and then it functions pretty much as you'd expect it to do so, no matter where you are, right? And then Kubernetes is also made up of objects. This is something you have to understand. If you're working, if you if you're working with Kubernetes, one of the kind of concepts that you have to grok your head around is that Kubernetes is actually made up of objects. Anything running inside a Kubernetes cluster is actually an object. Kubernetes thinks of it as an object. So that can be a pod, that can be a deployment, that can be a service, that can be a node, that can be a namespace, and so on and so forth. Absolutely anything you deploy on Kubernetes inside a Kubernetes cluster is an object. And the nice thing about it is that the way Kubernetes thinks about this is that every single one of those objects you can represent in something we call a manifest. So mostly that's written in YAML. Um, an example of a pod would be right there. So every single object inside Kubernetes 
hopefully I'm not overextending that, um, can be represented in a manifest file, right? Finally, Kubernetes can be declarative. So you can use Kubernetes in a declarative fashion. In fact, I'd actually argue that it's probably for your, in your best interest to work with Kubernetes declaratively. What, the, what do I mean by that? When I say declaratively, um, as opposed to imperatively, most engineers, most coders kind of think automatically uh, around the imperative point, where, you, where if you want something done, you tell the computer, you tell, you tell, the, you tell the system how to do something. If you're programming, that's normally how you do stuff, right? You tell it exactly what to do, how to do it in a set of set-by-set -set instructions, algorithmically, right? Declaratively, you tell it what you want done, and then the Kubernetes pretty much figures out for you what needs to happen to ensure that happens, right? So my favorite example, pretty much easy to understand, is that imperative would be asking somebody to buy you a pizza, declaratively would be just kind of implying that, hey, I need a pizza, I'm kind of hoping that they buy a pizza for you, right? Something like that. You can use Kubernetes both ways. So you can be imperative with Kubernetes, you can be declarative about Kubernetes. The nice thing about declar um, being declarative with Kubernetes is that you don't have to think about what exactly needs to happen when something needs to happen. So for example, if I want to deploy, again, that five copies of a pod, that five copies of a container on Kubernetes. I can just tell it, hey, I want five copies of a container. And then Kubernetes will, need, will figure out for you exactly what needs to happen. Like, do you have enough resources for it? Where do you deploy it? Right? How do you distribute it? Do you already have, like, some copies running and I just need to add into that? Or do I need to actually remove some of those pods? Um, you don't have to think about that because Kubernetes will do its best, again, to maintain that kind of sort of state, right? You want five? I'll make sure you have five, right? And I'll do whatever I can to make sure that happens. That's, a, that's pretty much how the declarative fashion works with Kubernetes. So now, putting all of those things together, all of those concepts together, you really can maintain a Kubernetes cluster with just a collection of manifest files. Remember, every single thing in Kubernetes is an object. Every single object is the manifest file in YAML format, and everything you can just, you know, declaratively tell Kubernetes that, hey, this is exactly how I want my cluster to be. This is exactly what I want inside my cluster, right? So if you think about it, you actually can ma maintain an entire Kubernetes cluster with just having like a plethora, a good stack of YAML manifest files, right? Theoretically, if you have a Kubernetes cluster and you have all of those YAML files that represent everything in your cluster, you can go to any other Kubernetes cluster, put those exact same manifest files, and voila, you've got a copy of your Kubernetes cluster now with exact same, thing, same things running, right? Because that's just how it works. Now, if you think about that, going one step further, my absolute mad lad of a colleague actually asked me this a few months ago, why don't we apply uh, CICD practices to those manifests, right? Everything in a Kubernetes cluster can be represented in a flat code file, and we can use that flat, those flat code files to describe exactly what needs to happen in a Kubernetes cluster. Why don't we pipe that through the same automated CICD tooling that we already use in application code, right? And that's pretty much the long-winded gist of what GitOps is. That's kind of like my long-winded introduction to it. Now, for my next magic trick, I'll try to uh, guess what your change management process is. And no matter what, you, what change management process you use in your companies, if you do use a change management process, hopefully, um, it, it will always gravitate, I think, at least, I see, uh, at least from experience, right? It will always gravitate to a few fundamental steps. The first one being that you have a managed product somewhere, right? You will have some artifacts, some material, a system, a solution, maybe a code base somewhere. It can be in a Git repository. It can be in an, you know, an S3 bucket, right? Whatever that is. You have something managed. Um, your change management process will dictate that somebody will have to introduce some change. Maybe it will be a bug fix. Maybe it will be a new feature. Maybe it'll be, just be some menial chore. I just need to 
you know, remove regression testing, for example, and so on and so forth. Um, hopefully, your change management process also has a way to review changes, right? So people can collaborate and talk about and discuss and um, um, pretty much review exactly everything that needs to change. If all of those changes get approved, then those builds are built, those deployments are deployed, those changes are incorporated into your system, right? And then you're back to step one. That's pretty much your change management process, hopefully, right? Um, Git flow, however you're doing it, monorepo style, multi-repo style, doesn't really matter. Pretty much, I'm thinking all of the change management processes will look like that. Now, if you think about it, um, how much benefit are you getting from that? Like, if you're applying that to your own applications, right? For your own engineering teams who are maintaining code, maintaining products, maintaining applications. A lot of it is quality of life, right? A lot of it's making just making things easier. Automated deployments, come on, right? That's, you know, I'll take... I'll take 10 of those any day, right? So why can't we use it to manage infrastructure as well? We've, we've all heard of infrastructure as code. We've all heard about CloudFormation, the CDK, uh, Terraform, et cetera. Why can't we use the same kind of tooling to automate our deployments and manage our deployments for our infrastructure and our, for all our resources, right? And that's really kind of what GitOps is. So I there's... You know, ask 10 people, you get 10 different answers. I kind of like this answer from the GitLab's documentation. Um, they, call GitLab's, uh, uh, they call GitOps as an operational framework. It's kind of a subset of DevOps that applies the best practices for application development onto infrastructure deployment and infrastructure automation. So pretty much the same things that you probably already are familiar with, um, you can apply to your infrastructure, or particularly in Kubernetes. Um, at least for this session. Uh, in an automated fashion, the same kind of expectations you have, code reviews, automated deployments, uh, pull requests maybe, and so on and so forth. All right? um, the way I kind of like to think about GitOps, there's really three things. One is you'll, you'll need some form of infrastructure as code. Um, you'll need some form of change mechanism. It's, you can kind of think of it as a trigger, what triggers what needs to deploy, right? And eventually you will need an automated deployment uh, format or a mechanism to deploy. In Kubernetes, easy enough, um, infrastructure as code is automatic. You already have your manifests, just like I described, right? All of those YAML files. It's pretty much your IAC. And then your change mechanism can be whatever your team is already accustomed to. If you're already using pull requests, for example, over GitHub or merge requests over on GitLab, um, up to you. Um, the really big question then is what would be your automated deployment mechanism? If you were doing, if you were doing this on Kubernetes, what would, make, you know, what would allow you to do automated deployments? And that's really where the Flux project comes in. So um, if you're not familiar, Flux is a project under the CNCF umbrella. Um, it's, it's pretty much managed by the CNCF, and it allows you, that's, that's pretty much the question it tries to answer, the problem it tries to answer. How do you manage automated deployments, uh, CICD pretty much, on Kubernetes clusters? Just like how you'd expect it in you know, any other system, right? Um, and it's pretty easy. <laughs> One thing I really like about it, it's, it's pretty easy to hook up to an existing cluster. So if you already have an existing cluster, it doesn't even have to be on EKS, for example. We're talking generic Kubernetes here, right? It can be on EKS, it can be on any other platform, it can be on your local, for example. If you want to hook up a cluster with Flux tooling to allow you know, automated deployments on it, um, you pretty much just have to run that command right there. So you'll need the Flux CLI tool. You can download that from the website, pretty easy. Um, and then you'll need to give it credentials to whatever your platform is for your repository. So in this example, for example, um, this is GitHub. So you'll, if, you, if you're working off GitHub, you'll need to create a personal access token and then give that somehow to Flux. And then off you go, right? Um, probably better to just show you what happens. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I prepared a... Terminal font size okay, yeah? So I, I prefer, pre prepared an EKS cluster. So if you're familiar with 
Kubernetes. Um, whoops, let me just log in. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Terminal okay? It's a man. Perfect. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So I've logged into my terminal using AWC Ally. Uh, if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you can act, you just use uh, the kube control, kubectl tool to kind of ask your cluster things, right? So for example, here I'm asking it for namespaces. So I've, I'm just showing you that I have a ready Kubernetes cluster for use, right? It, this is the pretty much the most generic Kubernetes cluster you'll see. So if you prepare a, an EKS cluster using the official tools, that's what you get. So a pretty bare bones Kubernetes cluster. Now, I already, I, already have, um, I already have a personal access token ready, but I'll just show you where you can go to do that. So if you're on GitHub, for example, you can go to your settings, then over on the very bottom, that you have your developer settings there, and then over here, you can just create your personal access tokens. So you have to create a personal access token. Let me just zoom that in for you. So you have to create a personal access token with... Um, You'll have to create a personal access token with permissions to manipulate your repositories because that's what Flux is gonna be doing. Um, once you create a personal access token like that, you'll, you'll, I won't generate the token anymore. You'll get, some, uh, you'll get a pretty long string. And then what you have to do, at least if you're doing this on the command line, is you have to store that in your GitHub token environment variable. Right? So once you put that in there, export, blah, like that, um, that's, what Flux will, that's what Flux will be using to bootstrap your um, cluster, right? So now, every, every single piece should be okay now. We have a Kubernetes cluster. We have an existing Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we have a personal access token to whatever we want to use. In this case, we're using GitHub. We just need to bootstrap it. So in this case, let's try that. Um, what was the command again? So it's flux, bootstrap. Um, I have to tell it that you, I want you to bootstrap yourself for GitHub, for example. Um, and then the name of my, uh, the owner can be a, a GitHub organization or a GitHub user. I'm gonna be using a GitHub organiza organization. And then I, I need to give it a repository name because what it, what it will do is it will create a repository under my control, right? So let's try test um, git ops repo. Um, I need to give it a path so that inside that repository, what will be the folder structure for where it's going to be putting the manifests, I can just say clusters, flux, uh, flux cluster, whatever, right? And hopefully this works. I've had pretty good luck with the uh, live demo gods this month, so hopefully I keep that streak going. So as you can see, what's happening is that Flux is talking to my uh, Kubernetes cluster, while uh, um, on the side is also talking to my GitHub um, account. So what it's doing is it's creating a repository on my GitHub account. It's populating that with a few manifests, the manifests being everything that Flux needs to run inside my account, my cluster, so that Flux will work, right? Okay, good, so that, that was okay. So once you see that all components are healthy at the, at the end, that's, you're good to go. So now, let me just show you what happened, right? There's a, there's a few things that happened here. So I went, so I called my cluster test GitOps repo, right? So it actually went inside my GitHub account, uh, in this case, I, my GitHub organization, and it created a repository for me. Inside that is just a few manifests. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you'll, you'll recognize this right away. But it created a few manifests in that repository for me. So that doesn't really tell you a lot. Now, the main difference now is that here, 
Remember that Kubernetes cluster I was showing you earlier? One of the things it did was it created a new namespace for me. So there's now a Flux system namespace inside where all of the components that Flux needs is running inside of, right? So pretty much two things. It created the repository with the manifests, and then it created all of the Flux components inside the Kubernetes, right? But that's not really the fun part. The fun part now is that because of those two things, my cluster now is watching that repository. Any change that happens in that repository will be reflected onto my Kubernetes cluster. So let's give that a try. Let me just clone this repository down to my local. All right, then open that into an ID. And this is what we've got. So this is exactly what I, what I was showing you, right? So we've already got like um, uh, entities inside. So let's try deploying, uh, let's try deploying something new into our cluster. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna write up that, en that same engine X pod that um, <laughs> the previous guys were trying to do, huh? So let's try that. Engine next pod. And hopefully I remember the, so this is a pod, a metadata. A metadata. Let's give it a name. My engine next, I suppose. I need to give it a spec. I need to give it, uh, which containers make up the pod. The name of the pod is my nginx, like that. Um, the image is going to be nginx. What's the latest version? 1.23.1? Uh, something like that. <laughs> just use the latest tag. Uh, just use the latest tag, yeah. Container port. Oh, whoops, sorry. And then not really needed, but let's give it a container port. Like that. Okay, so this will deploy a pod, but instead of, but instead of the standard, you know, kubectl apply f whatever, right, giving it the YAML file, what we're going to be doing is, I'm going to be committing this to my Git, GitHub repository, right? So this will be uh, introduce new nginx pod like that, and then I'll push that in. So. You know, if you think about it, since everything now is managed within your GitHub repository, I'm, I'm being really, really fast about everything here. But in reality, you really should be going through the whole change management process, right? There should be a pull request. There should be a review. Everybody, you know, the reviewers need to be, you know, talk about the changes that need to be made, that needs to happen, and so on and so forth. Um, so if I re refresh this down, I've updated, the, um, I updated that. Let's see if... That's actually deployed. I kind of think we, we're, we're already hitting an error now. Okay, let's see if that actually deployed. It did not, because that, I, know, I know why. Because we didn't. <laughs> We didn't give it a namespace. Let's just have that deploy right there. Wasn't there is there no logs to tell you? Yeah, yeah, there, there is, there is actually. And I'm actually trying to think of how to get to this. So, <laughs> Cube, um, CloudWatch, yeah. Hold on, repository, I have that. Um, the get customization, I have that. Um, kubectl logs, whoops. Oh, sorry, sorry, flux logs. Okay.
Oh, weird. That should have worked. See, I told you I used up all my luck with this month. <laughs> Let's just see if this will fix things up, yeah? You think it's everything except Git push? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully it's just a Git push. But that's pretty much the idea of it. So what's happening now is that inside the, inside the cluster, these are, these are the kind of the low-level changes that are happening, right? Um, I showed you that the, in the cluster, what's changed is that the Flux Bootstrap process created that um, namespace for us. So it now has a Flux system namespace. Inside that namespace, it's running a few controllers. So for example, These are all that that's happening inside that um, Flux system namespace. So I should be in the right namespace, yep. So there's a few services, there's a few pods that are pretty much just managing the Flux system inside a cluster. And then it, um, there's a few objects there that are watching my Git repository. So the source controller over here, this, this guy, is taking care of everything it's watching, all of the sources, like Git repositories and all that. And then the customized controller over here, that is, ha uh, that is taking care of everything that needs to sync onto my cluster. So if it sees that something has updated with a source, the customized controller then takes that and then applies that onto the cluster, all right? Let's see if that, that's now worked, yeah? Uh, still no. Okay. I'll give that a thought, but that's pretty much all you had to do. So there's probably something wrong with my manifests. So that's how you do the bootstrap thing. And this is exactly what's happening, like I just, showed, I, I just described. So when you deploy the Flux system or the Flux, Flux uh, project onto your Kubernetes cluster, what's happening is that between your cluster and any other source, be that a GitHub repository or a GitLab repository, you are essentially deploying pretty much two fundamental things. One is a source. So in this case, this is a Git repository source, uh, a customization object. So two objects, right? Again, the Flux source object, it takes care of watching for changes on the source. And then the customization object then takes care of uh, syncing whatever those changes are back down into the code, uh, back down into the cluster, right? So if you actually take a look back into here, oops, these, this, these are the actually two important things that the Flux Bootstrap deployed. So one is the Git repository source, and then one is the customization object, right? So I think if ever you try to do this for your own systems or for your own clusters, what you have to what I personally change every, every time I do this is the intervals over here. So by default, Flux will look at your Git repository or your source by default every minute. And then over here, it will sync any changes it collects every 10 minutes. Um, that's under the customization object. Now, for personally, I think the customization for 10 minutes is a bit too um, lacks, so I kind of narrow that down a bit. And there's really no, there's really no non-benefit to kind of narrowing that down. I normally bring that down to maybe two minutes or something like that. So the thing you have to understand here is that um, what happens when a change is affected? So if your Git repository changes, some code files, some manifest files changes, what happens is that the customization object gets the manifest files from that Git repository and runs a kub, uh, kubectl apply on your cluster. So what happens is that if you manually change stuff on your cluster, those changes will all be over, overrated as well, most likely. Because what happens is that uh, the customization will just run kubectl apply or whatever is in the Git repository. So now your Git repository becomes your single source of truth. Right? Whatever is inside your Git repository is what's supposed to be running in the cluster. Another benefit of this kind of approach is that for, I guess for a, a lot of reasons, you can kind of narrow down exactly who has credentials to uh, directly talk to your cluster. Who has 
the permissions to actually run kubectl blank something on your cluster, right? I've seen uh, I've seen some groups who've gone away with no giving nobody access to the cluster at all, and just making sure that everything is right there. And then if they do need to give a you know direct access maybe for hotfix debugging or investigation, then that's when they give temporary credentials. But because if you do this then there's, you know, there's almost zero reason for anybody to actually deploy directly onto your cluster. So you can kind of pretty much outsource that kind of permission down to the deployment system, to pretty much your uh, Flux system, pretty much. Right? So that's really what's, uh, what's, uh, what's happening under the hood. So that also means that if you think about it, you can kind of explode this, you know, you, you don't have to have your cluster just watch one repository. In a more practical sense, in, re, you know, in a more real life situation, your teams will probably be managing multiple repositories that make up, you know, multiple products. So you can actually set up your cluster to have multiple um, instances of those customization sources. So you can have your cluster have like um, set up multiple, uh, watch multiple repositories, for example, and then whenever those repositories change, your Kubernetes clusters just adjusts and changes for you, right? What do you have to do to make that happen? Pretty much this. All you have to do is just create more of these things, more Git repository sources or whatever sources there are, and um, customization sources. If you can see, um, the, object, the object manifests are pretty simple. They're just, you know, where, where is the source, right? Where's the repository, and then what is the path to the manifests inside that repository? And then Flux pretty much does everything for you and manages all of that for you, if it works. So, <laughs> okay, so definitely that's something, you, uh, that's something you can do and something I all, uh, see happen as well. Some quick, quick fire things of what else you can do with Flux. Um, if you use Helm charts, it's compatible with Helm. Helm is kind of like a templating language, a package manager kind of thing for Kubernetes as well. So you can use that with Flux as well. You can set it up with notifications. So whenever something happens to your cluster, you can, it can throw an automatic um, notification to your Slack, to your Discord, um, or even to your raw um, notification endpoint in JSON format if you'd like. So you can throw it to Elasticsearch, for example. Um, automatic updates. You can have it watch, it doesn't have to watch a GitHub repository. It doesn't have to watch a Git repository for that matter. You can have it watch an arbitrary source. It can be an S3 bucket. It can be an image tag in an image repository. If the tag changes to a format that you specify, then update the repositories to match the image, for example, and so on and so forth. Um, and then one thing I really like doing is I want, I switch Flux to using a pub sub pattern instead of a polling pattern. So if you remember me telling you about the intervals, it actually polls every minute, every five minutes. You can switch it back so that it's instead a subscriber format. So it only syncs when you tell it to. So you can have your CI/CD um, frameworks automatically tell it via an API call, for example, to sync because something's changed and so on and so forth. Right? So where can you go to learn more? Uh, just in case you want to take a look at everything I've been telling you. So some of the stuff that I, I, you probably will work with if you're working with Kubernetes are there. Uh, you'll definitely need kubectl, definitely, to talk to your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, if you don't know, EKSCTL is the official tool for managing infrastructure on Amazon EKS. So that's right there as well. If you want to create an EKS cluster, it's an ECS, EKS CTL create cluster. Uh, Flux is right there. That's what I've been uh, showing you this entire session. Then some other things, um, kubectx and kubens are very, very useful tools for switching between Kubernetes clusters. Um, if you work with Kubernetes, these two tools are really a godsend, particular for me. And then if you want to work with Kubernetes, um, play around with it without having to deploy those, you know, huge um, deployments. Minikube is pretty much a single node deployment on your local. So you can run a single node Kubernetes cluster on your local using Minikube and then try out whatever tools you learn from there. 
We have a dedicated, just in case you didn't know, we have a dedicated um, web page for containers and containerization technology, Kubernetes included. So that's right there as well. Pretty easy URL to remember. Um, something I like much more than that is we actually have a dedicated workshops portal as well. So we have quite a few containers, EKS, ECS, all of those things kind of workshops over at that workshop portal. It's just at, and I neglected to for, uh, I neglected to put the URL, workshops.aws. Sorry for that. Uh, I should have put that there. So pretty easy URL to remember anyway. And that's it. Sorry for the demo not working. Um, I'll try to figure out how that happened. Any questions? Yes. Yes, sir. Um, two questions. How, how does Flux compare to Argo CD, for example? I actually haven't tried that, so I can't. I can't really compare. Okay. The second one is like, say someone makes a mistake. Yeah. Um, but, but but unlike yours, you, you you have something running. It's working. And then someone makes a mistake, like chooses a, an image tag that doesn't exist or something. Yeah. Will, will the service go down? Or? Well, um, Flux, is, Flux is pretty dumb in that sense that it doesn't know about those things. It doesn't care, to be honest, right? All it cares about is deploying. So like what, uh, like what you saw earlier, if something fails in the deployment, it pretty much just doesn't deploy, right? Now, what happens is that, uh, I think the more important question would be, what happens if you want to do a rollback, for example? Something, you know, you, we deployed something wrong. It actually deployed successfully but something's wrong with it and we want to roll back, right? Um, Flux for the, for the most part also doesn't do rollbacks, particularly because um, Flux philosophy is that single source of truth, get repository, all your sources, right? So if you want to do a rollback, you'll need to do a rollback on the Git repository itself and then have that sync down back. So there's no like canary type? Well, you, you can set it up to have a, um, those kinds of deployment. There are, on the documentation site, there's kind of like a, a collection of blueprints, Canary included, AB, um, a blue green, and so on and so forth. What you can do, uh, it does have some monitoring with Prometheus, for example, so you can have it work like that. Just not on its own, I'm assuming. Yes, sir, did you want to ask something? Oh, sorry. I was thinking, you could use the kernel to make a robot. I'm sorry, I didn't get that question. Uh, I actually haven't tried, so I, I, can, I also can't say, but I'll take your word for it and say yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I had a question about uh, what's the story with I am in Flux. So for example, is there a way where I can tell Flux not to modify the resource, even if it's been collected in the repo? Yes. So you can you can adjust you can deploy new things in your cluster, and proactively tell Flux not to touch it. So the, it, it, if I remember correctly, you just have to append your object with a label with a very specific label so that it's kind of opt out, that Flux doesn't touch, touch this whatever. So even if it's satisfied with the repo, it won't get modified? As far as I know, yes. So there is kind of an escape hatch if you need it. And you can, you, you can tell Flux to pause or suspend syncing, for example, for emergency reasons if you need it. So you can do that as well. Okay. And I think I have another question similar to what you asked earlier about um, what happens with complex modifications in Flux. For example, if uh, my manifest in the Git repo includes, uh, like, it's a very bare bones template, does include, for example, resources. Mm. And if I add resources manually, and then, say, if I change some other thing in the Git repo, the merging that happens on the API server will probably include the resources that I added manually. Mm. So, essentially, it's an incorrect manifest that gets applied. So, that's Flux card against these things that warn you if some object was modified earlier. Okay. Okay. Good question. So two things. One is um, the thing you have to understand with Flux at, at under the hood. The the really fundamental thing it's doing is it's really just calling kubectl apply. Ah, right, kubectl apply, right? With your manifest in the Git repository. So I guess I guess a good rule of thumb would be if this doesn't you know if kubectl applying 
all of these manifest files in one go is not going to work, then it's probably not going to work with Flux as well. Second thing, um, Flux is pretty much, uh, it's a bit intelligent in the sense that it knows like a, a, a fundamental order of things. Like for example, if you, if you do a, a, git, a git repository change wherein you put a namespace and then a pod that belongs to that namespace, Flux will be able to do that. But I think that's really not because of Flux, but that's really because of kubectl, right? So I guess r rule of thumb, if it, doesn't, if it will not work with kubectl one time, big time, then it's probably not gonna work with Flux. If I would like sum it up, Flux provides you a big good repo project. A bit, yes. That's the that's kind of like the short version of it, yes. Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Is it open source? I think so, yes. This makes me think. Can you just have a GitHub workflow doing doing kubectl apply? You could, yeah. So why this? Huh, very good question. Um, particularly because one, one of the really good things I like about uh, Flux is because all of the logic that goes into the action of deploying and ma managing your cluster is in one place. Right? It's just in your cluster. But if you do, for example, if you have the, um, that last thing I was talking about, like you have multiple repositories and all of them you have to kind of point towards the same cluster to deploy and so on and so forth, right? it becomes a little bit tedious, don't you think? So I think that's kind of like, you know, one of the, one of the kind of deal makers for me. I kind of like coming from that other end. I kind of like coming from the cluster stem. Um, can you give an example who is using it and uh, what did it save or what it accomplished? Ah, well, I, I, I don't really have uh, something top of my mind, but I, I remember the Flux website having, there we go. So they have, they have a pretty good list over there. Ah, well, well, I do, I do know some, but I don't think I can share. I'm sorry. Okay, uh, sorry. This, this will be the last question. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry for the question. Uh, thank you for the topic. I really like it. So, um, as I understand, it's yeah, integration with like GitHub or GitLab and so on. Uh, so, does it provide any like let's say deeper integration? So, for example, when I press merge. Uh, of my pull request, I actually want to see what happened to it. So if, uh, in your example, if it was not able to deploy my pod, I want to know about it. Mm. Uh, and is there anything nice uh, for such integration? Yes. So um, Flux does come with a few events that happen within the, the framework, right? So one of the things you can actually do, like, as I shared, is that notifications. But you, one thing you can also do, for example, is you can have it report back to your repository of how your deployment went. So for example, uh, you can set Flux up to be part of your GitHub checks as part of your pull request approvals, right? So that, that's part of it as well. You can hook it up like that. Oh, okay. no. Sorry, um, I, I know we're out of time. So if you have any more questions, feel free to connect with me on those um, social media links and I'll be happy to answer them for you. Thank you for your time. Yeah.